All right. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the second installment of the Technorama Tuesdays webinar series. Tonight, we're talking about documenting your station. My name is Hannah Murray. I'm the Student Services and Compliance Officer here at the Community Media Training Organization. I'm also a board member of Technorama, and I'm here tonight to assist you in asking questions throughout the session and making sure that things generally run smoothly. Before we get stuck into tonight's webinar, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we are recording, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. In tonight's session, we'll be covering a lot of topics. We'll be covering software tools, technical wiring diagrams, manual storage, record keeping, off-site recovery, Chromebooks, uh, block diagrams, cable plans, asset registries, best practice documentation, password repositories, and documentation for CBF grants. And of course, there's so much more. <laughs> um, here to guide us through the webinar, we have our wonderful presenters for this evening. We have Stephen Wilkinson from Hope 103.2 FM. If Stephen can pop up. <laughs> and um, Yeah, we also have uh, Chris Deacon from Art Sound FM. And of course, we have the wonderful John Mazels from Technorama. Now, as I said before, you will notice that there is a question open in the poll for you to have a look at. If you could answer the question, that would be wonderful. All of your answers are anonymous, so there's no naming and shaming going on here. And uh, for now, I'm going to hand us over to the wonderful Stephen to get things kicked off. Thank you, Hannah. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I, we're, we're the, the thing that we're here to talk about is the importance of documenting your station, whether that's any technical wiring, but also where you store any documents for your, um, for you know, your uh, uh, things for, uh, <laughs> sorry, for your accounting and that sort of file storage as well. So that, that's important. Um, so firstly, I'd just like to hand it over to John Mazels to sort of give us a story, a good or a bad experience uh, from him with documentation. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. Look, what I'm going to do uh, maybe is show you, this is a real life experience um, and it was in television, a little bit more complex than radio, but the same principles apply. And I picked up what turned out to be a really great piece of, of engineering consulting. They asked me to come in and sort out studio and go, well, it's built, but actually we can't use it. And I said, well, what documentation have you got? And they said, here it is. And they gave me fundamentally the six AutoCAD diagrams that had come from, um, had come from the, uh, the, the vendor. Uh, the name of the vendor is probably a complete secret. I would never give anything away. <laughs> but if you look at this is the diagram I was given. And not just this one, I was given six of them. These are on, they were on A1 sheets. They were humongous. I sort of unfolded it. I'll just sort of zoom in a little bit on this. So you can see what I was dealing with. Well, you know, signals come in and they go through uh, well, I don't know, whatever that thing was there. And then they come down to, well, this and, and then through that. And so I had to start my career in this place by taking this documentation and going, yeah, what does it really mean? Now, after a little while, all this training that I'd done in community broadcasting and radio uh, came to the fore and it started to make sense. And so you look at a thing like this, okay, here we've got, it's a switch. I knew it was a switch. It says it's a switch. It says it has cameras going in and it has program going out. And as you'll see in a little bit, there is a formula that is used by people who do these diagrams a lot that make them sort of easy to read in the same way as you open um, a copy of Harry Potter and you expect it to say table of contents, preface, chapter one, chapter two. Mm. After a little while, it gets pretty easy. There you go, Stephen. Oh, that's a good story. Um Chris, do you have a bad story or you got some good stories as well? I've got a good story and a bad story, Stephen. Uh, the good story is I was up uh, a transmitter site and the uh, STL had uh, been hit by lightning and all it had wrong with it was it needed a reset. Uh, but I didn't have the IP addresses handy. But fortunately, I had my trusty USB stick in my pocket on which I carry all my important vital information when I go to a transmitter site. 
and I was able to reset the, uh, the STL, the ubiquity. Uh, the bad story is that I've spent the last two years, one day a week at a station that has 75 crone blocks that are undocumented, completely undocumented. The whole station, in fact, is pretty well undocumented, except for the digital part of the station, which was installed a couple of years ago, and that's completely documented. However, transitioning from the analog to the digital is an absolute nightmare. And it's it, like typically uh, tracing through telephone wiring that was uh, placed many, many years ago in the analog world, copper, around three studios, has taken like five hours per cable. And, wow. And, that, and it just is a complete waste mm -hmm. of time. Unless you have proper documentation, you have a major headache. And especially, as you know, with Chrome blocks, that's... It there can be you know, 20 pairs of cables or you know, on one set of chrome blocks and trying to trace that from one point to another if you have no documentation yes it is a really in depth and even worse if if you if you find suddenly that you've got power over ethernet on a cable and you've you put your ethernet tester on the end of it it blows it up <laughs> yes that's this happened right. this happened last week in fact and yet this is so easy to get right. And like I find that um, using tools as simple as a spreadsheet to start laying out Chrome blocks and keeping tabs of where cables are going as part of my design process automatically generates documentation. You can hand straight over to somebody that says, well, this is what I intended. Might not be as built, but this is what was intended. Mm. Well, I think that's a good segue into diagrams and <laughs> uh, John's phone making noises and uh, uh, yeah, signal flow and how best to document that for somebody else who might come along. Right. Um, I'm going to say this is this has already come off the rails because just one second here. Did oh, you document God. it? Yeah, no, no, no. It was the um, it was the piece where I needed to go and and grab control of the screen. So let's see if I can do. This. There's a question Just... about crown blocks uh, for definition of a crown block. Uh, yeah, Stephen. Yeah, if you could. Oh, yes. Some people wouldn't know what a crown block is. Um... Would you like to explain it, Chris? Uh, I've got a, I've got a whole frame of them uh, here. If you would like to ask answer that question in a bit. Yes, yes, John. I'll I will, I will come back and I will show you a frame of Chrome blocks. Okay, great. All right, cool. You're right to continue? Um, yeah, well, you should be seeing uh, the Technorama Tuesday documenting your station. Picture tells a thousand words. I hope that's what you're seeing on the screen. No, we're seeing you. Oh, you're seeing me. Damn. All right, I need to press that button. There you yeah, go. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Right. Um, first thing is, uh, a picture tells a thousand words. Almost everybody to whom I have shown this diagram has looked at the words and gone, puke. Because the first thing you see is that awful type in the middle. But has the picture told you something? Well, yes, it, it definitely has. I've only got 15 minutes here and I'm determined to not run over time. So I'm going to take my phone and put it there where I can't see it. And in 15 minutes, I can't possibly tell you everything there is to know about diagramming. Now, um, we will tell you a number of times that there is a really good CMTO course called Tech for the Non-Technical. And part of that, Tech for the Non-Technical, part of that is a session on how to do documentation at your station and how to do diagrams. So we're sort of giving you a bit of a preview of something you can in engage in later. I will say that the most important piece of diagramming you might ever do is going to be for that CBF grant where you want the assessor to understand exactly what you've got right now and what you intend it to be. And I can say in the time that I've been doing CBF grants, the standard of documentation has improved dramatically. So these days I might get a submission and look at it and go, okay, I understand what they were trying to do. And in the 15 minutes that I've got, 13 minutes now, I'll try and give you some tips to make your diagrams even better and even more succinct. But look, there's, it, it's a really simple formula. If there's one thing you're going to do with the diagram, it's going to be communicate to somebody. The diagram is completely useless if it doesn't take what's in your brain and adequately 
connected to the brain of somebody else so that they can get exactly what you intended to portray. It needs to be accurate. It needs to be readable and it needs to convey that information to everybody who reads it. So, you know, there's a bit of language involved. So, okay, here's an example. Suppose, um, sorry, but where do you need documentation? Uh, you need documentation everywhere. The documentation that we're going to talk about tonight, and indeed block diagramming, can be used, well, certainly your studio site, the transmitter site. It can be used to, to diagram uh, links. It can be used for outside broadcast so that somebody picks up your OB kit, and in there is a diagram of how it should work and how it should be connected. And by the way, they're different things. The block diagram of how all the, the bits connect together, the knee bone is connected to the thigh bone. So the microphone goes into the console, the console goes into the limiter, the limiter connects to the, the tie line, the tie line connects to uh, a 4G circuit. That can be depicted as a block diagram. That's not the same as the diagram that shows this wire goes into that socket and you have pictures of the wires and the socket, but they both do something very important, something, something quite similar. And you can apply the same technologies and te techniques to network and IT hardware and software. And Stephen will talk about that uh, a little bit later. Now, your documentation doesn't have to be done with AutoCAD. It really does not. The best form of diagram that you could have is the one that exists. And if that's the one that took you five minutes to do and you just scribble it off on a piece of paper, then it's excellent. But by the way, the technique that you develop learning how to do scribble diagrams is a really good design tool. So as you get good at very quickly taking you know, the back of a napkin in a cafe, which is how all good technologies have been designed, you know, the IBM PC was designed on the back of napkins over coffee. Um, it was really. Uh, that's a scribble diagram. You can, you can go to process maps and you can go to formal block diagrams and you can go to interconnection charts and you can do that with AutoCAD, but the simple scribble diagram is just fine as a start. One second while I... On television as well. Yeah, exciting. The thing is, if it's not written down, it's not useful. Until you have this stuff out of your head and onto a piece of paper, it's not useful to anybody else. That's why we asked you the questions at the start of the webinar. How confident really are you that somebody could walk into your facility, take the documentation and get things to work if, God forbid, you have fallen under a truck? So, all right, now the basic architecture of a station. We can do this in words. What have you got? You get program sources, you've got a studio, you've got control, you have a transmitter link, you have a transmitter, you have antenna, you have monitoring, you have computers and IT infrastructure. All right, they're the words. From these, you should be able to infer something about, well, it's a station. This is very generic. Nobody's going to be fooled by that list. But these will give you the basics of what you have. But how are they connected together? The thing is, as soon as I give you the diagram, even if I didn't give you those words, you will go, ah, I see. And clearly over here, you see we have studios. We have something else coming in. We have some control infrastructure. We have... Uh, an audio processor, we go through the link, we go off to the transmitter via a stereo processor through the actual exciter and then out the main antenna and somewhere, uh, somewhere else we have a receiver and we listen to the signal because radio is much better when you can actually receive it. The picture is telling you so much more than those words did. Now this picture follows a very specific format and by the way you will notice this is a hand-drawn diagram. Um, I did this diagram in, in about five minutes uh, and then I went and photocopied it and then scanned that and then pasted it into a series of PowerPoints and used that for a major presentation and nobody came back to me and said, uh, that was hand drawn. No, it doesn't matter. Here's the diagram in detail and let's have a look at, at what is here. Firstly, the diagram stops, sorry, the diagram starts in the top left. Now, this is sort of a convention. It's what 
people have been doing for some time. So we start at the top left and we work our way gently to the bottom right. So as you go from left to right, you are moving from inputs and sources to eventually destinations. I've cheated a bit down the bottom of the diagram where I actually show a receiver and show signals coming back the other way. Well, you can, you can see exactly the signals come back the other way because there are arrows and I needed to show something specific in this diagram. So I broke my fundamental rule and deliberately showed signals going backwards. But as far as possible, you try not to do that. You try not to have lines that are angled. Now, indeed, on this diagram, I've again deliberately broken a rule and showed some angled lines. But the bulk of the lines are all horizontal or vertical. And again, there's a reason for that. It's because it makes the diagram significantly more readable. You'll also new notice that I've shown uh, a selection of standard symbols. So the microphone that's up in the top left, this thing here, that's the standard symbol for a microphone. I didn't have a standard symbol for a computer, but I invented one. You'll look at this diagram and go, it's a computer. Over here, well, this could be anything. It happens to be a CD player. It would have been very easy for me to label that. I didn't. But over here, I said, well, here's a box. It's formless, but it says it's a stereo processor. So again, nothing ambiguous about that. This is all about really, really simple stuff. And over the top, we have some additional words that show something about that collection of things. So here's all our studios, here's all our control. Over here, this is specifically uh, main antenna. Down here, I've got some arrows that come in and say, oh, we've got a signal that comes from DDN and we've got a signal that comes from some other audio. Which way is it going? There's an arrow. It very clearly shows which way the signal is flowing. This is an example of an extremely clean diagram uh, and it's a very simple diagram. And this is exactly the same format with exactly the same level of readability as that incredibly crowded A1 shrunk Sony diagram that I showed at the start of the uh, session. John, so, just yes. this. Yeah, the, um, the, the, uh, yes, the one that says control. Yeah. What, can you just elaborate on what that's doing? Sure. Um, anything you want it to do. And here, here's the thing. A lot of stations have the studio connected directly to the stereo processor. They only have one, one station, one studio. Um, some stations have very many studios. Somewhere in a rack, a cupboard, uh, under a desk, there will be something that allows you to select which studio is going to air. And that could be a simple switch. It could be a set of plugs and sockets. It could be a very sophisticated studio switching system. So it's like um, it, what we would call delegation switcher. It could be or, a delegation yeah. switcher, but, but this piece that says control mm. could just as easily be a pair of patch cords that just get shoved into a, uh, into a pair of sockets to change which studio is on air. It's a functional description rather than the name of a box. But if, I, if this was a specific box, I might label it and say, oh, this is an XYZ123. Yeah. And okay. it comes from this supplier. Yeah, yeah. good question. So um, all of this will be available later and you will of course be able to read it, but I just thought I'd put down some of the basic rules. So you're gonna start from the top left, work towards the bottom right. That is an absolute golden line, golden rule. Try to keep the signal moving from left to right. Try not to go back on yourself because that often confuses the reader, but if you're going to do it, make sure lines are clearly visible. Use horizontal and, and vertical uh, lines and only use curved lines where there's a very, very, very good reason to do it. Because curved lines really make diagrams hard to read quickly. When you have two wires crossing, if they actually intersect, you put a blob there. If two lines cross, but they're not actually interconnected, don't put a blob there. And somebody reading that will say, okay, the wires go past each other, but they're not actually connected. If you can find a standard symbol, like a microphone, like a pickup, like a pair of headphones, use that. If you can't, draw a box and label it. It's, it's really, really simple, but clear. Okay, so, um, in fact, I should have shown this before. Okay, everything I've just said applies to this diagram. And in fact, here we are, next page, we've still got the same diagram. Um, show the signal flow. It's coming from a source going to a destination or from source going to a destination, depending on which way you're watching this. And 
under all circumstances, as the signal goes, at the end, put an arrow. It says the signal is going this way. You should never have a diagram in which it's not obvious that the signal is flowing one way or the other. By the way, if you have a circuit like a telephone, a telephone line, technically it's a pair of wires and the signal flows in both directions uh, on the wires. Put arrows at both ends, easy to fix. Um, identify your connectors. So at the end of the arrow, maybe you say this is an XLR or this is a DIN connector or this is an RCA connector. Um, as soon as you start doing that, of course, you will have words or you might use special symbols to show a particular type of connector. It can get confusing. Put a legend at the bottom of the diagram that says, well, where you see this box is shaped like that, this means it's a spifflicator. And then you don't need to label it as a spifflicator every time that appears on the diagram. Label anything that isn't obvious. Label anything that is obvious. Some people will look at your diagrams and go, that wasn't obvious, even if it is. Label everything. When you're doing multiple diagrams, there will always be more than one version of a diagram change the version on the diagram. This is not the version you are looking for, Luke. And a really easy way to do that, you can use say V1, V1.1, V1.2. Um, I find I very quickly get confused. I have now uh, started, well, in fact, the last two years, um, anytime I create a file and I save a new version, or if it's just a hand-drawn diagram, I put the date and the time. One thing that is really pretty sure is you are not going to save two copies of the diagram at exactly the same time. Highly unlikely. So if you put the date in year, month, day format and the time in 24 hour format in that order, you will find that you can sort every version of the diagram that you've got very simply inside Windows Explorer or whatever other tool you use for finding or losing files. Um, also put your name on it so that people know where to go uh, and who did the diagram and who's responsible for the last change. Pretty, pretty important. Um, <coughs> if you use colour, and I think colour is really great. Now, the, the diagram on the screen here is a monochrome diagram. I find colour to be very, very useful, but really important. Don't assume everybody's going to read the diagram in colour every time. Go and test what happens if you scan it or fax it, is it still readable? Can you still understand? Sometimes you'll use a color, you put it on, on the scanner and the color vanishes completely. Uh, make sure that color diagrams can actually be read in monochrome. And a final really strong point, use a drawing tool by all means. I mean, really, really do use a diagramming tool. They're great, but I'd say don't go to the diagramming tool until after you've done a couple of hand-drawn uh, versions. And the reason for this is quite simple. Um, you can do a diagram like the one that's on screen at the moment in a very small amount of time, very short. And it's perfectly adequate and it's perfectly adequate for the files and it's probably even perfectly adequate for handing into to the CBF. Nobody's gonna look at you and go, that was hand drawn, <laughs> out, no. But this took five minutes. I've also done diagrams for clients where I have drawn exactly the same thing and it's taken me an hour and a half to do it with a quick, pretty quick diagramming tool. Five minutes versus an hour and a half. What is your time as a volunteer worth? And the five minute hand drawn is probably just as good, but by all means, go for the CAD. If that's something you feel you can do, something you can, you can do quickly. Don't feel that you have to do it. Once you've done a diagram, by the way, and this is a really good trick for presentations, um, you can use that diagram to show lots of things. You can step through the diagram. You can say, oh, here's the other bit we're talking about. Uh, this is, by the way, what happens at the transmitter, and down here we're talking about the receiver. That was done with a hand-drawn diagram and PowerPoint and took me about three minutes to, uh, to animate. So, what resources do you have available to do diagramming? One, um, the hardware tools, a pencil, and an eraser. Do the diagrams in pencil, have, um, have a rubber. Works every time. Software tools, okay, there are different types of di diagramming tools. I've seen people do diagrams using Word. Word does have a diagramming function. You can draw pictures in Word. It is the worst tool to use. Why? Because it is impossible to revise. And as soon as you move something, <laughs> the diagram falls apart. 
AutoCAD, on the other hand, is incredible. Every, most of the world's major diagramming is done with, with AutoCAD, but it's an incredibly complex and very expensive tool to use and takes a long time, but it is very rich and very powerful. It's just, I think, not the right tool for a community broadcaster. There are many tools that sit in between. So when you go looking for a tool, what tool should you use? Right, the right tool, you should be able to place objects. You should be able to draw lines between the objects. As you move the object, the lines should automatically move around and stay connected to the objects. And the best tools, if you have two blocks like this and they've got a, uh, an arrow line between them and you pick this one up and move it down, it will change to a line that goes like that. And it will just all happen automatically. You want the tool to be affordable and you want it to be usable and you want it to be usable by you and the people who follow you. So if you pick a tool that you've got like AutoCAD and everybody who comes after you can't afford or use that tool, you've created documentation that's essentially useless because it can never be updated. Now, I, I had a quick thought about some recommended tools. I have three that I think um, are good for different reasons. One, Visio. Visio is ubiquitous. It's available with Microsoft. If you're a not-for-profit and you've got the connecting up deal, it comes with that very, very cheaply. And it's often bundled with uh, some versions of Office. So it's available quite cheaply there. And I've like almost nothing as a not-for-profit. And I've seen it even on the web as low as $10, and I don't quite know how you do that, and up to $700, which is actually, it's, it's a list price. So somewhere in there. I personally use a tool called SmartDraw. I love SmartDraw. I bought it when it was a shareware tool. I've continued to invest in it. It is incredibly rich. It, um, I think it outperforms Visio in many, many ways, particularly in templates and the, the graphics that it's got and the tools it has to help you create, uh, create diagrams. And because I think it's actually pretty pointless, um, pretty pointless talking about something without showing you because a picture tells a thousand words. Um, this is a timeline that I had to do for a project I'm working on. So uh, there's a template inside SmartDraw and I had this set up in about, uh, 10 minutes, pretty much as fast as I could type in this data, putting in start and end times. And it did something not dissimilar to Microsoft Project in laying out the times. But then with one click, I have another diagram that shows everybody when critical things happen. And indeed, if I wanted to, I could, it will give me the, what is the mind map that created that. And it will also tell me because I've identified names, who's doing what. So this is the sort of power that is inside a good template. You can, you can look for functions like that that are uh, within the tool. Okay, there we go. Can, you, can I get rid of this? No, yes, I can. There we go. Um, SmartDraw is a bit more expensive though. Uh, currently it's on sale for about 250 US dollars, but once you bought it, upgrades are actually particularly cheap and um, I'm about to do a, a 90 buck upgrade from I think three versions ago. They don't make me pay for all the intervening stuff. Um, there is a wonderful program called AV Snap. Now this was created by a company called Altenex and they make stuff for distributing signals and they created this tool to help people draw diagrams that use their products and other products as well. But hmm, AV Snap is available free. Yes, really it is free and it is highly supported by Altenex. It's a very good tool. It's very high function for basic processes. It doesn't have some of the extensions that Visio and SmartDraw have or AutoCAD has, but it's a great tool to keep you going. And I'll say again, free. It's good value. If you're gonna search for diagramming tools, go and use the search free diagramming tools. Sounds pretty obvious. You'll find a lot. You'll find some that are actually for computer flowcharts and other things you don't wanna do, but you will find some, some pretty rich information. Um, there are many lists. There are many types of tools. There are many free tools that actually aren't even though they say free, like you download them and you go, oh, but you actually want to do something, pay us another $5,000. You will also find invitations to use cracked code. And my strong recommendation to you is don't. One of the Google hits that I found said, yeah, you really don't know what's going to come along for the ride and trash your facility. And then, of course, you're going to have to listen to what Stephen and Chris say, because they're going to tell you how to recover from things that go wrong. So. Time for Stephen. Do we have any questions? Uh, yes, I was just going to 
ask that question uh, if you if, can. If anyone has any questions uh, in the uh, audience, there's a Q&A button where you can type your questions. Mm. Here we go. Comrie Bucknell has asked, the software you have <clears throat> mentioned are for Windows. What about Mac users? Bye. <laughs> <laughs> um, so look, sorry, I am not a Mac user. Um, I really don't have any knowledge of Mac software. I have not used Mac software. There is Mac software. There's no question of that. Um, anybody else want to answer that question? It's just, I can't answer it. No, I, I'm not aware of any right at the moment. Hmm. Um, you can get, I'm sure you can get Visio for Mac if you wanted to. Is there one? Yeah. We'll check. Well, yeah. well, we'll, okay, Comrie, what, what I'll do is I'll go and have a quick look and see if there's anything that looks to me like stuff that I'd recommend. We can come back and talk about that at the end if I find something that I think is a winner. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All of this and more we talk about on the Tech for the Non-Technical class. By the way, the Tech for the Non-Technical class is designed to bring people who really aren't technologists, you know, station committees, managers, um, uh, senior volunteers, up to speed with what is what is the technology in their station and what they need to know about how to make it work. And so understanding documentation means they can pick up some documentation and go, ah, I know how it's all connected. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it. I can't do it, but I can talk to somebody who does. It's pretty important. Great. If people are interested in knowing the polling results for the question I asked at the beginning of the webinar, Ooh. I've now broadcast them so we can actually see how people feel about um, their documentation and whether someone could come in and keep their stations on air. That's so um, yeah, like to have a squeeze that, at that. That's a bit of an indictment, isn't it? So, so really what we're saying is only 16% of you really feel comfortable that your documentation is good enough that somebody could come in and recover from an uncomfortable situation. We'll be focusing on this at Technorama, film at 11. <laughs> um, yeah, great. Oh, you've taken your screen off. Thank you, John. And uh, yeah, did you want to um, share anything about how, how people can look at um, technical for the non-technical? How do, how do they I go think, about well, that? Well, it's a CMTO class, and I think that's more one for Hannah, and yes. we'll tell you at the end of this webinar. So hang around. Great, I will. Oh, looking forward to it. Uh, so any more questions on that topic? I think I saw somebody uh, in the chat said about, is, is this sort of required for um, IP audio? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, it's required. You uh, you really want to be able to, uh, even if it's audio over IP and there's audio coming in, in various um, nodes or various other ways, you still need to show a signal flow uh, for your for your station. You you can use this for anything, any process in your station that needs doing anything that has an input, a process, and an output a source and a destination and something that happens in the middle, this is a good technique. The accounting processes work like that. It's not just, not just related to you know, station audio and, and uh, network technology. Mm, that's right. Mm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Chris, would you be able to, do you have any thoughts on the best way of people for keeping records and where to store things and how to share this information that hopefully you've documented. Yeah, if you'd just like to um, put up the first uh, slide there, it might be useful. Uh, I'm, I just wanted to uh, cover a couple of things that John actually made mention of. And that is that it's not just technical files that you're interested in storing. It's all these aspects of your station are potentially useful to people that follow you in, in your history at the station. And uh, it also includes, of course, your audio production files. Uh, it includes uh, passwords, uh, your website, photographs to restore, to uh, re record your station's history and all that sort of stuff. There's absolutely no point in having it on your network and on your computers unless it is backed up, ideally off site. I mean, there have been uh, terrible situations where um, 
problems with the network have occurred, but because the network is down, people are unable to access the information about the network. So obviously it has to be written down, either uh, IP addresses might have to be printed out and saved in a, in a special red book, or uh, saved on a thumb drive or kept off site. At Artsound, we, uh, we're moving towards, um, we have a lot of this information on a network attached storage device at the moment. It's backed up on various computers and our plan is to set up a second network attached storage device at our transmitter site and link it through our digital STL, which is a ubiquity with tons of spare capacity for overnight uh, updates. So keep in mind the importance of backing up your information. Um, you can pull that slide down and go to uh, one of the other ones there, Steve, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, we'll just go, uh, that's all about backups. Uh, you've got to store this information on something. These are the various things that you can use. Um, our preference is to use Dropbox. It's uh, available to everybody on our team uh, and management can also use it. It's the, the most important attribute is that you can carry it with you on your phone when you're at the transmitter side on the occasion when you really do need that extra information or access to a manual. So we keep all our technical manuals for every item of equipment on Dropbox. So, and, and it has been our savior many times, many times, whether you use Dropbox or OneDrive or Google Drive or a portable USB drive, doesn't matter. It's important that you're able to access it easily uh, when you are not necessarily in the station as well. And of course it becomes useful from a collaborative point of view with your technical team. Everyone can access that information at any time. So if the proverbial bus does come along, uh, they have got access on a shared basis to that information. Now keep going to the next one, Steve, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, there's a few more. Obviously cloud storage is another option. Um, your own uh, PCs, the NAS I mentioned, and uh, rapidly going out of date uh, SD cards. Um, John mentioned a few tools. These are a few others that uh, I've come across. There's one that I'd update you with, which I've discovered recently, which is very, very useful. It's called Draw.io, Draw.io. Check it out. It's a very simple free uh, uh, drawing package, very similar to Visio, but uh, very, very handy. Um, Passwords, uh, there are various tools. Uh, I know one station uses Excel. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Excel is great, but don't just have it on your network where people can access it. Uh, make sure it's password protected. Also make sure that your, uh, your file is backed up offsite again in case uh, you really need it. For example, to access your network passwords. There are various other bits of software like LastPass and KeyPass, lots of free tools on the network. And while I think of it, uh, there's a rack drawing tool to help you lay out your rack uh, equipment and document the location of that, particularly important for some transmitter sites where Broadcast Australia demands a diagram. Uh, also lots of rack drawing tools available on the net. Uh, I'd also draw your attention to uh, the ELAN website, elan.com.au, have lots of information there about how to document your wiring, your crone blocks, and your patch panels. Uh, it's available through elan.com.au. Um, other bits of information, uh, things that may not be as obvious to some people, uh, actual firmware and, and software, backups to your software that you have on your computers in the station. Uh, backups to your automation system software and and previous versions should you require should they should the latest update not work and you have to downgrade to another version make sure you've got several versions available around your station so you can use that uh, I think we've got um, there's another diagram Steve that has um, just a picture of uh, one of those flow charts. It's the block diagram one, which I'd just like to show you. John was mentioning the value of block diagrams and this is one that we use at Artsound every year. 
as slight changes occur to your system setup, you can just add the boxes as required. But if you're going for a CBF grant, and that's what this diagram was used for, you can put a like a red box around the equipment you're after. So in this case, it was the tie line codec on the left and a tie line Merlin codec on the right. That was a successful grant application. And uh, we tend to use that every time we do a grant application with a red box around any other equipment that we happen to be wanting to upgrade or or add to the system. I'd commend that to you. And that was done on PowerPoint. There's another one there uh, to show you the sorts of things that you might want to keep in your station. Uh, there's a, well, that's a, that's a second diagram with a, an example of transmitter information. There's things like logical flows, how to, how to arrange in a digital uh, console system, things like your telephone delay switching logic where someone else may not have been involved when it was set up. It's important to, to document that, to explain that. I would like to, to work with this one. It's not one I've actually implemented. It's just an example of one that you probably want to try and avoid. But uh, there are other examples, of course, like how to answer the telephone in your, in your, in your station, how to, how to set up your uh, voice over IP network with the right, uh, the right software. And there's another one there. There's uh, some audio cabling examples of a very busy diagram. It's actually handy to, to do diagrams that show management, what you've got in the station, not just your technical team, so that they realize the complexity of the amount of work involved in, in maintaining such a setup. And of course, we've got there the uh, revision box at the bottom, and it, it just shows you although fairly complicated, but it does show you from a, an operator's point of view where the audio goes. I think that's probably it for the moment, Stephen, unless there are any questions. Um, oh, I just, one mention of uh, another piece of software, if you're interested in trying to back stuff up, of course there is a lot of free stuff on the net, but we, we actually bought a program for 75 bucks, it's called Good Sync. It's extremely user-friendly program, allows you to back up anything to anything across anything in the network at any time, uh, hands off. You can program it and schedule it to do this. And we find it extremely useful, including for, uh, for backing up and transferring audio to our automation system. And of course, how that works also has to be documented so people understand how to upload programs to end up on the right folder at the right time. So thank you for that, unless there's any questions. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, are there any, does anybody have any questions or would like more detail on any aspect of that? Doesn't look like it. While Chris was talking, I went and found the Chrome blocks. So, for anybody who's never seen one, this is a frame of chrome blocks. There are 15 blocks here. Um, you punch wires down onto those spaces between the connectors. Uh, it, it's great for wiring up, particularly analog uh, infrastructure, but also digital infrastructure, if you're careful. And there are digital versions of this that enable you to do it. It means absolutely no soldering. Um, believe it or not, I've just implemented a complete um, a complete piece of Crone patching at home. And um, Crone can even be self-documenting. If you have a look here, I'll just show you, there's a little, you can get these little flip down labels, which when you flip them up, tells you what is on each pair. So that when you come out and you don't have your Crone documentation book, that of course you've done, um, you can quickly flip up the pair, go, ah, that's what on that, what's on that pair and uh, attack it, move on. These we've are just, great. We've just got a question from Peter Fitzpatrick. Hi, Peter. Uh, what do any of the three of you use uh, for software for automation? You mean as in broadcast automation? Do you mean it's switching studios or do you mean playing music? I'm not sure. He'll have to tell mm. me. Music. Music. Yeah. Music. music. music probably, it's probably out. We can, we can talk about that if we have some time at the end. It's probably outside the scope of, uh, of this webinar, but the topic of another one. 
yeah and it's it's a bit Sorry. like how, how long's a piece of string um mm. everybody has an opinion it's a great great topic by the way that that's a great topic that comes up on q and a fairly regularly mm. so um you sign up for the facebook page and go and um ask and check the question there yeah the technorama q and a facebook page uh huge great, resource yeah yeah it's a big it's a great community of uh people who are willing to help people out and as i said probably one of the um hottest questions is how many what software do people use for a play out and there's probably about 10 different answers to that uh thank i'll be you. putting up links to um all of the websites that have been um, discussed at the end of the webinar for everyone so that you will be able to have a huge spray of information and um, look up all these beautiful links that everyone's talking about. Great. The question I had for you, Chris, was, um, so with firmware and software, uh, so firmware for, so many, so many devices these days have a firmware or an inherent program in them, um, as well as software that you would use and install regularly on computers. Where and how do you store that? Well, it's, it's a real pain, as you know, because some, some products are constantly upgrading their, their firmware, including automation systems. And by the way, to, to answer that question, we use Radio Boss, just implemented. Um, but they upgrade it like with the new version every two or three weeks. So wow. um, I find that using Dropbox, once again, is the best place to store the firmware. I mean, you need to maybe go to a, a paid version of Dropbox to give you the multi gigabit storage, like 20 gigabits. And it means you can throw everything on there without worrying about running out of space. And it's well worthwhile. I think the, you know, maybe the 75 bucks a year that it costs and it's off site. So if it, you know, it's, it's really backed up, it's not going to go down like your, your, your station's hard drive is, and it's available everywhere. So yeah, put your firmware on that. It, it covers your, your STL, your, your ubiquity link, uh, your, your administrative side. Um, the different versions of all your software can be stored on there. Very, very handy. Yeah, and I suppose um, your um, folder structure within say Dropbox is very critical of how you, so that you can easily find things as well. Yeah, and one of the most important things I think I mentioned earlier was storing the actual manuals for every item of equipment. And I know some stations are all, all the time looking for a copy of a manual for an old item of analog equipment, for example, an old desk. Well, we find uh, just just keeping a storage of all those uh, on online is extremely handy because uh, it, it helps with for training as well for younger people coming in to, to help learn the system. You know, make them read the manual. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A bit of time. So, so you still keep. I mean, it's very rare, unfortunately, in some ways these days that you get a physical manual with a device or you know a desk or something. But those ones that you do get, uh, do you, you keep an electronic version and the provided version somewhere? So, like a printed version. Well. The printed version for some of the stuff we have is like 800 pages long, and so we don't print it out anymore. Yeah, we, we just we just make it available to all the team on on Dropbox, and and you know it's a PDF. You just can't afford to print out that amount of stuff these days. Right. Um, we've got got a question, another question from David Ford, um, for all of us. Uh, what what is your recommendation on version control? and who can update the documents? Chris? Uh, that's, a good, that's a really good question. Um, I find as the sort of nominated leader of the technical team to be the, 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 the bunny that ends up doing it most of the time, uh, I think someone needs to be in charge of version control so it doesn't get out of hand. Um, and some I know has just pointed out that uh, Dropbox is $200 a year for two terabytes. Uh, I think they had a special deal once whereby if you, if you recommend Dropbox to your friends or your technical team, they'll give you a free upgrade to a certain level. So it doesn't always cost the full amount. So, so 
search around and maybe maybe there are some free versions as well that can be used. Actually, well, two things two things that we we do need to know one um almost everybody who's making software um, has a concept of a not-for-profit discount. And often all you have to do is go and ask them yeah. uh, via their question process and say, like, do you have a not-for-profit rate? And they might require to jump you to jump through some hoops. But you know, as soon as you can prove that you're bona fide not-for-profit, you'll get the NFP or education discount, which is generally pretty deep. Mm -hmm. Now, the other one is Dropbox. I mean, Dropbox, as far as I know, still has a freebie version. Um, I have the, you know, I don't know, whatever it is, US $110 version. Um, but if you've got the freebie version, every time you recommend somebody and they sign up, you get a small incremental amount for your own personal space. Yeah, as I just said, yeah. Yeah, which is how that works. The, the other, the other um, way to look at it as well is if you, as an organisation, have the not-for-profit, not for generally very reasonable Office 365 email mm. system yeah. um, from Microsoft. Part of that become you get um, OneDrive um, access, um, free storage. OneDrive. Mm. Uh, yeah, which is shared storage. OneDrive slash SharePoint, they're sort of mixing the two together now. But uh, yeah, that, that's a great way for doing the same and working the same way as uh, Dropbox does. And much the same thing with Google Shared Docs, hmm. where you can control, restrict uh, as arbitrarily as you like who can see and who can update documents. It's, it's, it becomes very important when you do a grant application to the CBF, particularly because they'll be asking for your apparatus licenses, for example, to be updated. And so you need to keep those online in a, in a place where people can grab them in a hurry because inevitably mm. you'll be running late with your grant application. Mm. Yeah, I mean, f and fortunately with, with firmware upgrades, that generally the firmware upgrades are labelled very well um, with the version um, down to, you know, about four digits usually at least. Uh, so storing that, you don't have to actually think about how which is the latest version because it, at it's least when you download, name. it's in the file name. Yeah. And, um, be, and be careful when you, when you upgrade your firmware that your hardware can handle it. Uh, mm. We've had instances where you, you can upload to a ubiquity link, uh, a version of the firmware that it will accept, but then part of the, part of the equipment will not operate any further. So you then have to downgrade again. That's why it's handy to keep your, your previous version. Yeah just in case just in case great just in case. there was a question there about another one about relating to automation i believe was, was there there was something about jazzler i saw there's a question from uh greg addison can you please discuss automation approaches for stations regularly hit with blackouts and brownouts our station can be off air for hours thank you Wow. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> well, the first thing you need to document is where your UPS is mm. and, and how that works. I'm not sure that like In important the last time topic, the batteries uh, were replaced. Yeah. It's, it, actually, that's a really good one because batteries have a service life of, say, four or five years under good circumstances. So actually knowing that you're due for a replacement would be a saviour. I'm just trying to think of the, the documentation spins on the question that was asked. Well, the thing would be if you're going to have issues like that is to actually have a you know, break glass now, you know, when we have a blackout, let's go to, Here's what look, you do. let's open this document and this tells us what, um, what we need to do. Um, especially when the power comes back, if you don't have a generator or anything to keep the station going. Um, so that way you're okay. First thing we got to do is reboot server computers, whatever. And, um, and you know, as a itemized list of yeah. what to, what to do, that would be the documenting way. And that's the time when you want the definitive list of all the station's passwords. So Chris talked about carrying the USB stick, but you know, you might get to a situation where you actually don't have any sort of IT capability, you know, phones have stopped working. 
it is always useful to put this stuff down on paper. And one of the things I used to do for a station I supported, I had a master password and I had a couple of cascading passwords from that. And all the team knew that, but I was asked on occasions, what's the master password? Well, that is not something I was going to give out at all, but I did have it uh, with the chair inside an envelope that was inside another envelope. And that was the break glass in, in case of emergency strategy. John another, one I I mention, another one I might mention is an in-studio emergency folder that, that hmm. documents what to do in case of a bomb threat or, you know, a virus attack. We've actually started preparing a, corona, a coronavirus strategy for our station in hmm. case someone becomes infected. Uh, we would automate the station, all go off site, and programs would be uploaded remotely. Yeah, so yeah, we're we're actually working on the same thing here um, as well. So yeah, you've got to try and be trying. I know, and it's hard for small organisations, but you need to try and be a bit ahead of the curve mm. with that sort of thing. Um, and it all comes down to documenting. It, it sounds really ghoulish, but the process of creating the documentation for an emergency like that. Um, and mind maps, by the way, are really good technique for finding out all the things that you need to do for a piece of documentation like that. Going through that process is incredibly valuable, uh, particularly if you do it at a committee or an extended level. What can everybody think of? Put it all down, reorganize it into some linear format, grab it, put it on the piece of paper, it's in the folder, everybody knows. You've already socialized the process. Mm. All right. Great. Thank you for that. Any more questions? I think that's it. Yep. Questions at the moment. Um, so I was just going to, what I was going to talk about was sort of more about a bit of IT documentation. Um, we've, we've had a, had a little bit of a discussion on that already. Um, a, a critical thing to, to do when with IT, of course, everything has an IP address. And um, in most audio via IP networks or even your main computer servers, whether you have one server or have 30 servers, you, um, or, and whether you have two users or 40 users, um, it's important to document the IP address of a particular machine. Um, even for a bigger organization like us, it, it really just comes down to a, a fancy spreadsheet really um, with multiple um, multiple tabs multiple layers of of the different networks that we have so we're, we're an axia audio over ip network um, station um, so every every device is listed and it's formulated in a way that if studio studio one is ip addresses from you know so it's from uh yeah, as an example, whatever 10.1.1.10, Studio 2 is .20, and anything that's associated with that studio that has an IP address is is within that those ranges. Um, and so that's for the audio over IP network. Same thing for servers and playout computers software um, as well uh, that we uh, document that. And it's just on a, sp a spreadsheet as well. Uh, with um, some stations I know for password management have a, um, a spreadsheet uh, which is actually password protected so yet yeah, a couple of people only have to know one one password uh, for a spreadsheet which then lists everything in that spreadsheet uh, but it's also as Chris talked about there are other software packages like LastPass and um, we use one called KeyPass, which is actually an um, on-site premise KeyPass system, but it is also backed up. Um, we we run we run numerous backups, and this is sort of to come to comes about for business continuity that we uh, we back up to. Firstly, we back up to a a separate building which has um, servers, backup servers in that. Um, and then we also back up to the cloud. And then we actually have um, a number of 
terabyte drives that are on a weekly, or well, well, actually a, it's a monthly cycle. So each week, and they they're rotated, um, rotated around, uh, so that we, at worst case scenario, we have a, a month old backup if everything else is lost. So it, it's, we have backups of backups of backups uh, for data, and that's that's all our software as well as our all the, the account, accounting type software and play out all our music. Uh, all data, <laughs> basically, uh, which is can, can end up being terabytes of terabytes. Um, but yeah, and as all, another thing that you should think about is an asset register. Um, so every piece of equipment just has a, a, a basic sticker on it. They're, they're quite inexpensive to buy, the little asset ones with this organization's name on it and, and a unique number. Uh, you can even do them with a, a, a you know, a label maker. Uh, and again, for a, an organization our size, all of the technical computer and technical equipment is listed as on just in a spreadsheet. Uh, it's listed with the purchase date, uh, the warranty of that, that device has and, um, and where it was purchased from as well as um, any any other details for that. So that's the spreadsheet that um, we just actually keep it on a spreadsheet. There are a number of um, asset management software applications, but that, that's sort of the way that we've been managing it at the moment. Um, Stephen, I was going to mention if, uh, if people out there have got particular tools that they use and, and would like mm. to share that with us, the Technorama survey is still up and uh, the equipment survey also covers things like software and tools like you might want to share with us. That survey, John, if I'm correct, is available till the end of the week. Yep. Yeah, yes, so Sunday. Next, next, next Sunday. It turns closes, out. closes on Sunday. Yep. Yeah. So get it in. Uh, you can go to the Technorama website and access that survey and we're getting some very, very interesting responses. It would be very useful to all of us to, to find out the results of that, which which I think John will be presenting at the the next conference. And that's that's what it's handy to actually have an asset register, so that you, when it comes to filling out a survey like that, uh, you, you will mm. instead of having to think, okay, what's that piece of equipment that I've got? Well, you'll know because you've got it in your list of, um, yeah, and you can sort it in date of purchase and type of equipment it is as well. So. Um, and we, because because we refresh computers and equipment every four to five years, um, sometimes three years for some computers. But uh, yeah, so there, it, there it is a constant refresh that you try to do there. And if you're in a if you're in a, a bushfire zone, very important to have that for insurance purposes. Not just in a bushfire zone, any yeah. station should have it. Yeah, and yeah, and so of course, as we've said before, that you keep that on Dropbox or OneDrive or, or other ways of backing up. Um, we use a backup software called Veeam. Um, it's a bit of an IT standard, V-E-E-A-M, Veeam. Um, it's not cheap, but it is very, <laughs> it is very good and being up very granular in, um, granular in wanting to restore someone actually loses an email, it can restore their actual email um, from a backup from a, a month ago. Uh, that's how granular it can get. Um, and uh, and as, as Chris said, uh, you can uh, backup, have a, have a, a NAS or, or a server at your um, transmitter site. If you've got, even if you've got a basic, um, ADSL type connection there. Um, if you do an initial full backup of everything and then physically take it to the transmitter site and then can uh, back up uh, incrementally after that, uh, then that, that's a good location, depends on the, the environment of your transmitter site. We're fortunate we have a, a nice air conditioned transmitter site, um, clean power and that sort of thing. Um, um, but yeah, that's 
that's a good way of um, having an offsite backup that yeah, you yeah. you know you're not paying for a cloud backup. And and don't rely on one NAS. Uh, NAS has failed. We've had we've had two out of four disks in a NAS in a RAID five array fail. And and of course we've all had a hard drive in a computer fail mm. after a few years. Um, some hard drives are better than others. So NASs have to have another NAS to back up another NAS or or, or, a, or some other backup strategy uh, for disaster recovery. And you can always put the scenario to your board, you know, what would you feel like if you lost 15,000 tracks worth of music that you need every day? That puts the fear of God into most boards and you shouldn't have too much difficulty uh, justifying some sort of backup mechanism, whether whether it's a NAS or just a simple offsite hard drive, or or even one of those, or one of these, um, one of these devices can hold a hell of a lot of useful information these mm. days. Yeah, some of some of our um, video production guys, they they have multiple, they have the same files on multiple removable drives like that um, as a backup. You're very unlucky if both of them fail, but you know. <laughs> It's, there's always a chance that one will fail, um, but for a, also for a um, continuity of service and continuity of business, uh, of course, what's the most important thing for a radio station, no matter what size you are, is to actually be on air. And you, as part of your documentation and your disaster recovery strategy, is that you want to be able to keep playing content to air, whether you because. In some ways, if you have sponsorship um, advertising, um, but if you have sponsorship spots, you you want as long as they're playing to air that then you um, hopefully there will be some continued uh, revenue and income from that. So you can even look at at your transmitter site having because um, you know a lot of people might, will probably have might have two transmitters and maybe two links, but if something totally goes at the station or if there's a fire or something even at the station um, if you can if you have a computer that can uh, as a backup disaster recovery um, play out software on there that then can still be syncing and playing your program to where uh, that is a way of guaranteeing your continuity of, of your business and which is radio and keeping on air uh, we actually have a standalone disaster recovery machine um, that is actually in a, a separate building. It's not at the transmitter site. It's in a separate building uh, and where our STL and all our links are. So if the main building goes, um, then we're able to broadcast from, from that room. Um, and, and Stephen, a lot of stations who have outside broadcast kit Already, therefore, Prima Facie have emergency broadcasting studio available to them. You just want to make sure that the OB kit isn't stored in the studio that's just burnt down. That's right. So, <laughs> and it's not only fire. We uh, the hailstorm in Canberra recently just destroyed our ubiquity uh, dish. Mm, yeah, uh, and and also managed to bend several elements in the UHF link. By the way, as well, oh, wow. aluminium, aluminium. Wow. The the Polarization is now somewhat circular in, in, in mode. <laughs> still on the air, but the, the backup was the UHF, was the backup for the digital link. So it's was still on the air. Right. And and as we know now, in most most stations, of course, are moving to IP and digital, that you um, you really need to... And in a studio, you've got truckloads is a technical term, truckloads of Cat 6, Cat 5 cable in, in a building, in a facility. Uh, so one of, one of my key tips is that every cable that goes from a patch panel to a studio patch panel, uh, every um, Cat 6 cable should have a unique um, number label actually on the physical cable at each end. So, you know, this is cable 1001, this is cable 1002, you know, and so when you're in, and you can make them unique for a particular rack. So rack one is in the thousands, rack two is in the two thousands as an example. Um, and a studio can be in a different number range as well. Um, but then that way that you know, you, you, 
that cable, if it gets disconnected from the back of a um, RJ45 um, patch panel, you're going to know where where the where it's where going. It and go where, back. Yeah, and I mean you can even back that up with a again with a spreadsheet listing where that goes from A to B. Yeah, um, numbering cables is incredibly important. And there are any number of ways to number cables. It could just be sequential numbers or it could be a structured numbering system mm. so that every cable that starts with a number one is IP, if it starts with a number two, it's analog, if it starts with a number three, it's AES audio. It really doesn't matter as long as you have a system and the cables are numbered at both ends. Yeah. Color-coded color -coded cables as well for important mm. broadcast links. Mm. Yeah, well, even, even on, a, on that, the, you know, you've, so we have a reasonable size patch panel of a whole lot of RJ45s from throughout the building and studios. And, um, you know, one, one, one of those patch points might be used for a office computer and another one might be used for the playout software and another one might be used for our audio over IP. Well, mm. those actual patch cables that we use to go from, you know, A1 to down to C10, um, we'll use each each network has its own particular its own color, color. Mm. so that from a glance you know or, or if you're having to repatch you go ah this is the playout server it's red I'll be careful if I'm not unplugging the station and taking it off air um, so it's important to do that I mean, this one is blue and it's just the boss's phone. Yeah, oh, that doesn't matter. Yeah. Or, um, worse, or worse, using a, a non standard power over Ethernet, which some uh, USB extenders have, hmm. and putting them into the KVM extender accidentally and blowing the two up. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Well, KVM extenders have their own color too, so hmm. for that exact reason. Or even if you have um, an ELAN clock system. Um, that has its own color as well for exactly the same reason. Um, yeah, so it's important. Um, at our main patch panel, um, RJ45 patch panel, uh, I, you know, it, it's all labeled A1, A2, you know, and there's a number of those sort of patch panels, um, rack patch panels. We, we, we have a, a cheat sheet, which is regularly updated that, is stuck on the wall, if you like, near the patch panel. Um, but the, I guess it's not un unique in that, you know, A1 is, as you say, the boss's phone and A2 is the playout server or whatever. But the, the thing that um, we found handy is that, yes, it's in numerical order as the patch panels are, but there's also a version of it that is in alphabetical order. So if you go, hey, I'm looking for the technical manager's office patch panel, I can look under T and I can see, oh, T, that's the technical manager. Oh, so that's, you know, D6 or something. Um, so having that there, because it's always in a rush that you might want to repatch something or need to repatch something. So having that information there and a way of trying to, um, you can look for it numerically and then another version of looking for it um, alphabetically by the name of what's connected to that port um, is He's just so a quick organized. Tip. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to be. It's documentation. Yeah. Uh, guys, look, we're getting we're getting well into the witching yes. hour. Yeah. Um, th there have been a couple of questions that popped up. There's actually a very interesting question just came up about the survey. Um, and will the will will it be available? Will will the um, Output be available? Yes. Will the input be available? Interesting. When I was asked, would the questions be made available? And that's something we can look at. But our aim is to take the data, ruminate on it, and then make the answers available uh, in some sort of wrap-up form that doesn't uh, allow anything to be directly identifiable per station. I've got right. an interesting question from Mike Kennedy. Um, would mm. Technorama be interested slash motivated to collect best practice documentation examples? Absolutely, we are. And in fact, the website already has a resources section. And if you go to the resources section, you'll find that there is a link to the ELAN documentation that was mentioned earlier. As soon as we find something that is useful to everybody, and, and these things come up through uh, the Q&A site, um, 
as far as, as quickly as we can, as often as we can, we will put those on the Technorama website, sort of keep it useful. So uh, it's in Technorama and look under the resources tab. Yeah, and feel free to submit any, yeah. Yeah. If you've got examples. The, love to R, the yep. one recently came up was the RF coverage software that's available for free on the web. Um, in fact, we should uh, definitely document that. So if you if you have a thought like that, you can just uh, use the uh, feedback page that's on the Technorama website or send an email to info at technorama.org.au and that will get to enough of the right people. Someone has um, said that they use safe in cloud as their password um, backup. Uh, it's free for Windows. Uh, that's handy. Anything's good as long as yeah. it's available to the right people at the right time yeah. and not available to the wrong people ever. Yeah, and someone asked, oh, you answered. I <laughs> just saw what is a NAS. Um, so, we've did, got, yeah. uh, Rod Pettit has asked, will you be discussing IPSTL at a future point? Uh, we discuss IPSTLs yeah. all the time on the Q&A website. Yeah. <laughs> Um, as quickly as somebody comes up and asks the question, you know, it gets asked. Uh, one, one of the great things about Facebook is that it's easy to use and a lot of people uh, find Facebook a very comfortable model. One of the really horrible things about Facebook is that you can have the discussion and then it just lost right down the end of, you know, antiquity. But if you go and you search on the Q&A page in the search box, you can often retrieve the pointers to those conversations that have had, happened in, in the past. And we don't mind that they keep recurring because there's, there's always something fresh to learn. Yeah, and there's always something new, you know, mm. to, uh, technology or a new way of doing th those mm. sort of things. Yeah, yeah so go, go to the Q&A site and just um, in, in the search box, just go uh, IP links. Uh, everyone, I have uh, just now repasted the links to everything that has been discussed tonight. Uh, so you'll have the uh, station tech for the non-technical course for CMTO. Uh, we have an upcoming webinar for Technorama Tuesdays, and it's about radio frequency and your transmitter. That's on the 31st. I've put mm. the registration link in. It will be a really exciting webinar. It's uh, international guests, so um, definitely sign up for that. It will be really good. Uh, we've also got the station technology survey, as we discussed, and uh, of course, some Technorama 20 conference information, if John would like to speak a bit more about that. Uh, okay, you, um, I was actually going to, um, oh. let me just, no, 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 no. I jumped ahead. Go. Hang on, yeah, 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 but it's, it's all right, you know, we're among <laughs> friends. Um, I now just have to find Mr. Zoom and say, please share the screen. It's one of the things that you discover is it doesn't matter how many screens you've got, it's never enough. Mm. So, okay. So the, uh, the survey is available until the end of the weekend. This is the first time a station survey has ever been done. We'd really like your input. If you haven't done it yet, please go and do it. Um, we're trying to get a, a feel for what it is that, uh, people are using and it's by station type and by region and by class of license and the information is going to be really really useful to the CBF the CBAA the CMTO and, and, and Technorama and particularly like you might think well what does the CMTO need to know with this well the CMTO is about training if we know what gear it is and techniques and things that you're using the CMTO can go and build technology classes around that it's, it's incredibly uh, valuable to know Technorama TR20, okay, go and have a look at the website. There's a, there's a story on the website at the moment. I can't pre-announce the guest. We are within probably two days of being able to announce who he is. He is a fascinating guy and uh, we're for the first time, we're gonna bring somebody in from overseas. Um, I think you'll love this. Um, he has both content and changing the world and technology. Um, aspects to his background. Technorama TR20 is going to be on the 29th to the 31st of May. It's going to be held in Toowoomba. We are going to be truly regional. One of the great things about Toowoomba, and you're probably going, like, Where? Uh, go and look it up on the map, but it's really easy to get to from Brisbane. It has a local airport as well, and it is going to be significantly, I think, lower cost than uh, a lot of the Cap City uh, venues that we've used. So think in terms of two people sharing a two bedroom unit um, could be under $100 each per night. 
So, you know, we think it's going to, going to work. We've got a, a great facility um, that's in the final stages of being lined up. And for programming, we're focusing on what it is that we've heard you need. We've just gone through the bushfire season, so we're going to focus a lot on station readiness. Are you okay for the next emergency? This documentation class is exactly part of that. And we're going to look at the skill that is least well known, which is RF. And we're planning for the Education Day on the 29th of May. So watch this space, how to build a transmitter. And uh, the people who come to the Education Day will do exactly that. They will build and debug uh, an exciter in the class. So watch for that. Um, we're expecting to open registrations at the end of this week probably just in time for you to have completed the station survey. Oh, and one lucky person who completes the station survey will get a free pass to TR20. So it's worth your time. Woohoo! Back to Hannah. Oh, we're back, yes. <laughs> okay, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for coming tonight um, and making an effort and staying till 10 to 8. <laughs> I really appreciate everyone wow. taking the time. And um, of course, thank you to our wonderful presenters for this evening. Thank you to Stephen. Thank you to Chris. Right. And thank you to John. If there's any further questions, uh, please uh, feel free to ask right now. And um, yes, all the links to everything that we've talked about are in the Zoom webinar chat. We'll also be broadcasting this webinar online on the CMTO website and on the CMTO YouTube channel so that if you missed anything or if anything wasn't clear, you can watch it again and uh, uh, tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, please, um, if you haven't already done so, uh, sign up to the Technorama Facebook page. The Community uh, Tech Q&A page is also a fantastic resource. And of course, uh, sign up for the next uh, Technorama webinar, which will be on RF and your transmitter. Um, that's it for- On the 31st of May. On the 31st, the 31st of, of March. May. Uh, of March. March, 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 March. March. Tuesday, in three weeks time, March. in three weeks time. So uh, <laughs> sign up for that. The link is in the chat and um, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, See you all later. Bye. Bye. -bye.